Hello, I'm Bill Martin. I'd like to welcome you to On the Banks. On the Banks is a fraternity podcast where we meet brothers, hear their stories, and celebrate the shared values of Phi Gamma Delta. Today, we're visiting with May May on Woody Way, an Ohio Wesleyan brother. In 2015, May May received the Wilkinson Award as the fraternity's outstanding senior. And in 2019, he earned a law degree from Harvard Law School. He now works as executive vice president of Evasort, a tech startup, and he joins us from San Mateo, California. As further introduction, I'd like to share with you a quote from a person who supervised May May uh, in a job, in a technology related job uh, while he was in college. This person said, rarely does someone come through the door with the capacity to pick up a skill set in such a short period of time. As we go through this conversation today and you learn more about May May, I think you'll come to appreciate the accuracy uh, of that evaluation. So May May, we wanna thank you for, for spending some time with us today on, on a, what I know is a busy schedule for you. Oh, no worries, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, really appreciate it and excited to chat with you today, Bill. Well, I know our, I know our uh, listeners and, and uh, viewers are gonna be interested in your experience in Phi Gamma Delta uh, at Harvard Law School and today at Eversort, but, but before all of that, uh, just to give us a, a, a quick uh, a review of your life before you got to Ohio Wesleyan, uh, a, little bit of your, a little bit of your background and then how you decided to, to go to Ohio Wesleyan. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. And so uh, I was born and raised in Southwest Ohio, born in Xenia, raised outside Dayton in a suburb called Centerville. You know, my parents, uh, my father's from Nigeria, my mom's from Ghana, you know, so I grew up in a very culturally diverse house. And going through high school, I was very focused on sports, on soccer, on track. You know, actually, I think our, our soccer and track team were both state runners up my senior year. So mm -hmm. looking at going to colleges, I actually first heard of Ohio Wesleyan via a call from the track coach there as part of a kind of a recruitment exercise. And, you know, I was very focused on sports at the time and they had a really strong soccer team. Um, actually during my freshman year, the Ohio Wesleyan, we actually national championships for, wow. champions for D3 in soccer. And so uh, I will say that my initial interest in the Ohio Wesleyan you know, did come from, you know, the sports side of it, not as much as the academic. Athletics uh, as opposed to academics at the time. <laughs> Yes, definitely, definitely. Understood. Uh, Understood. I'm, I'm sure it, very quickly you had to change some priorities there, though. <laughs> and, it's yeah. evident that, and it's evident that you did. So, so your freshman year, uh, Phi Gamma Delta is going to, was uh, in the process of reviving the Theta Deuteron chapter, a very old chapter in the fraternity dating back to the 1860s. Mm -hmm. It had been out of operation for a few years. Uh, some staff members from the fraternity headquarters were there, uh, along with some Theta Deuteron graduate brothers to recruit students to uh, form a colony and, and start the chapter back up. So talk about your intersection in that process. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So it was a really interesting opportunity and situation in that me and a lot of my friends, you know, we had gone through freshman year and decided not to go into Greek life. We had kind of foregone the recruitment opportunities that were available. But as you said, later in the year, there was an opportunity, you know, with Phi Gamma Delta coming back to campus and looking for founding fathers to, you know, establish, you know, uh, and, and reestablish the chapter, you know, on campus. And so actually a lot of folks from the soccer team, I think at the time in the whole soccer team, only three folks were Greek at the time. And so we saw this all as a good opportunity to kind of all get involved with our existing friend groups and kind of move into an organization like that. And mm -hmm. I know folks from, you know, there's a lot of folks from the as well and from all over you know the university who were excited and pumped up and so I think it was attracted by the fact that all my friends you know were joining this organization I wanted to you know remain close with them but also that kind of founding possibility right the idea that you can go in and really start something and you know build tra traditions and be on the ground floor was something that I thought was a, a really unique opportunity as well and uh, sure. very happy that to have taken the chance and not look back at all. Yep. Now describe your contributions in the colony and, and uh, uh, in your undergraduate time. What were some of your areas of, of involvement and, and contribution 
uh, to the colony and chapter. Yeah, it was really interesting. So like when I said that we, you know, from day one, we were really trying to rethink what it meant to be a chapter. You know, that actual day one meeting was also us choosing who was gonna lead what committees and what committee we would actually have. And I think one thing that was fun was that we really were looking to start something new. And so I had a proposal for a whole new committee called the health committee, you know, focused on activity and exercise, et cetera. And a different brother, completely unbeknownst to me, had his own proposal for something else called the health committee that was focused more on etiquette and building a better Fiji, et cetera. And so yes. we found out that we were both tasked as co-heads of the health committee chair. Um, and so we had different ideas on it, but really had the opportunity to build something together there. And then, you know, in the next two years that I was there, I said with the scholarship committee as we were able to, you know, within one year of being a colony on campus, supersede our university's uh, kind of the highest GPA on campus for any fraternity, which is really exciting. And then my final year as uh, the head of brothership, uh, we actually coordinated a campus-wide, university-wide interfraternal FIFA tournament where we're all playing this video game called FIFA in a broad tournament. You know, we raised thousands of dollars for charity. And actually the semifinals and finals played in a local movie theater where folks were kind of coming in, paying to, you know, eat popcorn and watch the semifinals and finals on the big screen. So really kind of even across different fraternities, you know, finding ways to bring people together, have fun and also give back. Yes, very good. So uh, what did that experience mean to you? Uh, adding, adding that, that fraternity experience to, to all your other undergraduate uh, activity and experience? What did the fr undergraduate fraternity experience mean for you and do for you? Um, I think it was crucial, um, frankly, because if you look at, you know, other, other, you know, you know, accomplishments and things I did, you know, while on, uh, while on campus there, you know, you know, me and a fellow brother, we ran for school president and vice president together. And then that brother ended up going to Ohio Wesleyan, you know, sorry, to Harvard Law, you know, um, and, you know uh, Andrew Paik. And then I was able to kind of see and replicate the work he had done there, the fallen footsteps there. You know, me and another brother, we were in moot court together. In our mm -hmm. first year doing moot court, we actually made it to nationals in Arizona and set the school record for, you know, our kind of accomplishment, you know, in that competition. Um, and overall, I think that it, it was a really unique in that we were selected by direct representatives from Phi Gamma Delta. And what that resulted in was a really uniquely kind of diverse and robust group of folks where I watched some of my first cricket matches because we had a sizable Indian and Pakistani <laughs> contingent in the fraternity, you know, yes. watching them go back and forth for days over a cricket match, I think of the World Cup, and I believe it was 2015, for example. And, you know, there was even folks that were more Nigerian than me, you know, in the fraternity kind of working uh, side by side. So it was a really unique group of people from that perspective, too, and kind of opened my eyes to just different ways of living and thinking. So um, what were what were what are all of the nationalities represented by the brothers uh, in the in the chapter? <laughs> it can recall. It's funny, it's funny because um, I mean, we had several, you know, we had Nigerian, Ghanaian, Pakistani, Indian, Korean, Japanese. Um, it's also funny in that we started our own family tree based yes. off the founding fathers. And so, you know, mine was the Onwudiwe clan, there was the Kaplan Corporation, there was the Rajpuria realm kind of of each person. Um, and in the beginning, we did notice that kind of uh, as we have a whole Khan empire where the first three generations all had the last name Khan because it was all folks <laughs> coming in from Pakistan. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was very, it was very interesting from, uh, from that perspective. And now uh, was, was Dowd Vaz, Dowd Vaz, was he a, a, a colony member? Yes, he from, Dowd Vaz. Uh, he's, uh, Af he's Afghan, correct? He is, he is Afghan. Afghan. So yeah. that, was, that was quite a diverse group. And oh yeah, I mean, a, we had Mainza Munu from Zambia, who's actually just recently started a new startup out of Kenya that uses uh, kind of AI to help folks kind of choose art and things. So it was, I mean, I, I don't really do it justice in kind of yes. you know, naming out the nationalities, but it was a really unique group of folks. Yes, and you hear this a lot, strength and diversity, but that was a truly diverse group and, and indeed was stronger because of that. Uh, because of that diversity and a much broader, richer experience for everyone to, to work so closely together day to day, I'm sure. Oh yeah, 100%. I think, and to this day, 
you know, I've got folks who are getting married in different countries. I've got, as, as you kind of, you know, move on that network of folks, it's not just people that you meet when you go back to Delaware, Ohio, right? It's folks yes. that, that you cross paths with all the time as uh, kind of diverse, you know, experiences build upon. So, so as you, uh, as you uh, approached uh, graduation or finished up your career at Ohio Wesleyan, you won a couple of very uh, impressive awards you received on the campus, the Meek Leadership Award, which is not a personality description of the recipient, right? <laughs> it's not for bashful leaders. It was named for Phil Meek, uh, 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 a prominent uh, Ohio Wesleyan uh, alumnus who also happens to be a Fiji. So I'm sure that was that was super gratifying for you. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you won the, the Wilkinson Award as the outstanding senior in Phi Gamma Delta and also named for an Ohio Wesleyan brother, uh, Scoop Wilkinson, who served for many years as the executive director uh, of the fraternity. So it, it appears that you were meant to be a Fiji, that that was just yeah. foreordained. Yeah, and I, and I also do have to note while we talk about this is that, you know, the history of Phi Gamma Delta at Ohio Wesleyan was something else that was a differentiator as we're going through, you know, recruitment processes and learning, you know, the legacy that we're walking into, you know, greats like Jack McKinney and Doug Dittrich and Dan Bennington. And, and even today, you know, I think Jack Foley, who, you know, started school after I graduated, you know, is now, I think, an Archon uh, coordinator, right. you know, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, yeah, over there. And, and they've said, and I think it's it's really borne out that a purple purple river does run through Delaware, Ohio. Indeed. Uh, so uh, I'm glad we, we, to continue the flow. We could have a whole separate on the bank session talking about the history of the Theta Deuteron chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so so you graduated. Uh, you took a gap year uh, mm -hmm. out of out of Ohio Wesleyan. What did you do during that gap year? Yeah. So during the gap year, I actually worked in um, uh, in Nigeria at the Nigerian Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. I was doing work there. I was at the time deciding between do I want to go into the law or more international development? And so I was applying to programs like the Rhodes Scholarship, you know, to look at international development and, you know, law schools in the United States to, to look at law. So and was also tutoring French uh, in the meantime. It was kind of a pretty typical gap year. Yes, yes. And so uh, you, uh, Andrew Paik, as you said, one of your Theta Deuteron brothers a few years ahead of you was, was two years ahead of you at, at uh, Harvard Law School. So you, know, you began to look there. As you, as you looked at Harvard Law School, were you thinking that a law degree would lead to practicing law or, or did you have, even at that time, have much broader sorts of thoughts about where your, where your career would lead? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely, you know, practicing law was something that I definitely had considered and thought about, but I think the choice of Harvard Law was really around the fact that I did want to explore broader options of leveraging, you know, my legal career outside of just uh, practicing law directly. And also at the time, I did apply for a, a dual degrees at several business schools at the same time too, but I really can't underline how important it was to have mentorship you know, from an Andrew Paik, you know, throughout this process. I remember, you know, because he was only a year older than me and, you know, we both academically excelled. We knew we had similar GPAs. And when he told everyone he was going to Harvard Law School, I'm like, well, how are you doing that? Because I've got <laughs> the same GPA as you. And so, you know, I didn't, I uh, did take a gap year while he was able to go straight through. But, you know, my first year was his last year. We lived yes. on the same floor in the dorms. Um, and it was just an amazing experience. And I think when we talk about any of the things I was able to accomplish at Ohio Wesleyan, I think it was really enabled by, you know, take, uh, helping me hit the ground running and get that like, initial understanding that might have taken others longer to take. So, so you're, are you saying that until you heard that from Andrew that he was going to Harvard Law School, that hadn't even been on your radar, that you thought that was something that would be possible for you? Yeah, honestly, um, going into undergrad, the decision was mainly between NYU and uh, Ohio Wesleyan. Yeah. And so throughout that, I was like, hey, I'll do NYU for law school. You know, and that was kind of my reach goal. But yeah, sure. definitely seeing Paik. And I think it's just a lot of things. It's you don't know what you can do until you see others do it. And that kind of uh, realigns your kind of goals and what you think is possible. Sure. Yeah, understood. Now, uh, let's see, in your first year at Harvard Law, we'll get into your, your later accomplishments at Harvard Law School, but your, sort of your very first accomplishment there was when you uh, participated in 
a haiku contest sponsored by the American Bar Association. <laughs> so what, do you remember your haiku? The haiku yeah. that, that, and you were runner up. So you were runner up in that uh, competition. What was your haiku? <laughs> Most definitely. So the, the haiku contest was about basically taking a landmark Supreme Court case and turning it into a haiku. So the Supreme Court case I chose was King v. Burrow, which is a court case where, you know, when people talk about, you know, that the court saved Obamacare, that's the case. And yes. basically the crux of that case was there's language in the statute that says, hey, um, for these marketplaces, these shall be the rules for all state marketplaces. And then the issue was that you know, there are particular things to make the uh, to make Obamacare work that required taking those actions at the national, uh, you know, uh, marketplace level. And the idea was, you know, are these kind of state marketplaces, can they also be uh, a national marketplace? And so uh, the haiku is, I can read it to you, it's pretty short. Um, <laughs> and you can keep track of the syllables at home. Uh, Obamacare saved such jiggery pokery are only states, states. And the reason for that jigapokery line is that in the case, Scalia, who's known for his, uh, you know, a colorful language said that to call a national marketplace, a state marketplace is jiggery poker. <laughs> <laughs> so you found a way to incorporate that into your haiku. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and you had, you had a busy time at, uh, 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 at Harvard Law School, you know, I've, I've heard people say uh, about law school that uh, uh, the sort of the uh, uh, axiom is in your first year, they, in, they scare you to death. Your second year, they, they work you to death. In the third year, they bore you to death. Was that, did that, was that how the experience played out broadly academically uh, at Harvard? Um, you know, potentially, but I do think that, and I think it was potentially even kind of Andrew's support that kind of helped me break a little bit out of that. But I feel, I think a lot of the time spent at Harvard Law was focused on, you know, using the opportunity that you have as you're a student there to really kind of push forward and do things that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do. So I definitely took classes seriously, went to classes and did my homework like that, you know, but I did a lot of extracurriculars, as you know, you know, took opportunities to meet with leaders who were visiting to start companies, to start programs, to start journals and to, to, to really look at making that kind of impact, knowing it's only a short three years. Yes. So, so you were so involved that, uh, that in your final year, you received the Dean's Award for Community Leadership. Dean's Award for Community Leadership. So tell us specifically some of the things that you did that, that uh, sort of went into uh, uh, earning that award. For you. Yeah. Because obviously it, it uh, uh, identifies someone who has been involved in doing a lot of things besides just carrying the challenging academic load of Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think one thing I did was really increased my engagement around the continent of Africa. And so, you know, while on campus, I was the president of the Harvard African Law Association, you know, and really helped to put on programs and help with, uh, you know, symposiums and academic opportunities for folks to think about, you know, legal issues from an African perspective. Um, I also did a lot of interdisciplinary work. So I wasn't a student at the Harvard Kennedy School, but I was actually uh, put as the editor in chief of the Harvard Kennedy School's Africa Policy Journal. Mm. And through that, you know, I was actually able to do interviews with the former president of Ghana, the current president of Ghana, um, the former president of uh, Nigeria, and just lots of folks and stakeholders from the continent who visited. And I think another aspect was just on the technology side. You know, as you know, while at Harvard, uh, me and you know, some students from Harvard Law and some PhDs from MIT started a legal tech company that uses AI to pull out data from contracts. And so once again, even though I was a student at the law school, I spent the bulk of my time at the business school working out of the Harvard Innovation Lab, training algorithms, you know, mm -hmm. developing a business from that perspective. And you know, we even actually set up the first ever, and folks actually were surprised that it didn't, it, was, it hadn't existed before, but you know, I was the founder and co-chair of the first ever Harvard Legal Technology Symposium, mm -hmm. right? Symposium yes. at Harvard Law, where we brought kind of top shelf people from across the United States and abroad to talk about 
you know, what changes are happening when it comes to technology, you know, for the legal practice. Yes, yes, which was right up your alley uh, with, with your Eversort connection that was developing at the time. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, so regarding Eversort, as you said, you, you pitched in with, with people who were, who were and joined that group that was starting Eversort. And, and uh, now since you've graduated, you're executive vice president there. Uh, tell us what, what Eversort does and, uh, and the, what the value is and why you're excited about it. Yeah, most definitely. So at a high level, Eversort structures unstructured data and we focus on contracts, right? I mean, the inception really came from, we were students at Harvard Law, very excited to be lawyers, you know, we've been working at it. When we begin to get a taste of the law firm, we see that the projects that we're engaged on are processes that didn't really reflect what we were doing in law school. Right? You spend all this time in law school reading these cases, doing deep analytical thinking about, you know, how to weigh these different, you know, issues. But when you get to a law firm, they're like, hey, in these 10,000 agreements, can you find this clause in all of them and put them into an Excel sheet so we can review, right? And I think we also saw a mismatch from that. We could tell that the technology, just the, the issues that we were being asked to solve were things that technology could already solve automatically. Right. You know, it doesn't take we weren't data scientists. Right. But we could tell that if we were to provide enough examples of language to an AI analytics tool, it would be able to perform the tasks of parsing that we were asked to do. And so we basically made a contract management system. And in the contract management system, it used to be that if you wanted to remember, hey, when's this contract going to expire? You'd have to type the date and then it would remind you. Now, once a document enters our system, we read the contract. We pull out over 50 data points, you know, clauses, key dates, key information, who are the parties. And so if you need to ask any questions or do any kind of reporting or auditing into your contracts, you don't need to do a broad scale manual project to have someone read everyone. All that data is already there. And as your needs change and you need to find new language in your contracts, we have a really simple UI where you can train your own algorithm without data scientists to find that new information on the fly. Wow. So, so you said, wow, you, you found out there's a lot of drudgery. There can be a lot of drudgery in practicing law. So we're going we're gonna to try to clear as much of that drudgery out <laughs> through, the, through the use of technology. And that, now that becomes your, becomes your work rather than, that, rather than the other work of actually practicing law. Exactly. So, so your job, uh, your job, executive vice president of legal and business intelligence. So what do you do? What sort of it's a relatively small company, so I'm, I'm sure you do a lot of different things, but what's the main focus of your work there? Yeah, most definitely. Well, it's evolved a lot. If you can imagine, when I joined, it was kind of five folks sitting around the table at the Harvard Innovation Lab, whiteboarding. You know, now we've got folks from across multiple countries, about 80 people working for us in the United States alone. Um, and so I can go from wearing basically many hats to uh, kind of uh, lesser so. I think at this point, I still do serve a bit of a liaison role from the AI team perspective as we're kind of, you know, building new algorithms and looking for and what it takes to build uh, things from that perspective. I do a lot of client work day to day, you know, working with our existing large clients, seeing what kind of projects they want to move on and how that lines up with what we're doing. And I also actually have actually been uh, giving back a little bit to lead a team that we call the 2L Fellows which is that, you know, when we were law students, we knew that we were interested in doing more than just practicing law. We didn't see many outlets for engaging in that in the professional, you know, perspective while we were students. And so as, you know, now, you know, owners of a company, we actually have a program where we hire annually several different law students who work with us on projects throughout our organization, right? Because we built a company, I mean, our COO, CEO, right? All the finance, all the marketing, it was all done by lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so we understand that, you know, a law student can be more than just someone to review your NDAs, right? It's actually someone who can add real value across your business. Because if they couldn't, then we wouldn't be a company. Right. right. And so uh, right. we, you know, it's, it's much more than Harvard. We have folks from, you know, Arizona State, USC, Miami University, you know, who are students working with us and they're, uh, and I'm, you know, leading that program and uh, hoping to expand it as well. So uh, yeah. lots of different work. Every day is very exciting. Uh, understood. Understood. So um, obviously the, your, your history is, uh, uh, as we've, as we've 
uh, talked about your undergraduate time, your time at Harvard Law School. You've always had a number of balls in the air. You've always had more on your mind than just whatever the, the, the central activity was, whether it was academic or, or work. So, so now uh, with, at, at Eversort, you've, you're out, you've got your degrees. Uh, outside of your work, what are some things that are important to you? What are some, what are some things that you're looking at and where you'd maybe uh, you know, like to have an impact or have some input uh, outside, of, outside of work? Yeah, most definitely. And this is outside work, but also, you know, uh, a bit inside work, too. And I think it's something that we've all been kind of, you know, dealing with, and especially this year, which is really just issues around diversity and inclusion as they happen kind of throughout society. And so, you know, as you know, it was, I think, what a seminal moment for me and a seminal piece of working and being part of, Ohio, of uh, Phi Gamma Delta was the fact that we were the most kind of diverse, you know, uh, fraternity on campus while we were there. And I noticed that kind of going back recently, I think the last time I went back, you know, I don't think we had any African-American students who were, you know, part of the fraternity at that point. And so I think it's something that I've learned is that, you know, although it was a very, a very precious thing that we had there, it does take work and deliberateness to actually keep that going. That's something I've learned at Eversort too, as we've grown and I've maybe seen that maybe we're not bringing in as many diverse people as I would want to from that perspective. You learn that it's not something you can just kind of sit back and think is gonna occur, that you are gonna have to lean in a little bit and be deliberate about it. Because if not, you know, the kind of powers that be and the forces at play will, will not lead to the outcomes that, that you're looking for from that perspective. And I think especially, you know, I think now we're looking, I think it was just last week that there was, you know, another shooting in, in Columbus, you know, where Ohio Wesleyan is of, I believe it was Casey Goodson, you know, yes. uh, I think anything we can do, and I've, I've talked to the brothers there as well around, you know, capturing some of the magic that we had in the past and trying to reinvigorate it there, I, I think would be, uh, would be, would be really good. And take take pride in that in that diversity. And I know there are there are studies that show the value of companies, the, the greater the greater value of companies that that uh, that emphasize a diverse uh, workforce. Uh, and again, as undergraduates, it's a diverse world. It's a very diverse world that we live in. And the earlier the earlier people can begin to learn about that and be exposed uh, to people from from a variety of backgrounds, the better prepared they're going to be. Uh, for the world that they're going to enter when they uh, when they get out in the workforce, mm -hmm. uh, and and the fraternity uh, the fraternity uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, the Archons uh, formed a, a, a DEI committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. So that's something that is something that the fraternity is looking at in a deliberate and thoughtful way uh, of of uh, uh, help seeing how we can make chapters and. Uh, uh, the fraternity more broadly, uh, more diverse and, and more inclusive. And that's excellent. I gotta say, I mean, I think the fraternity did a great job in the initial selection of our kind of team and group. And it's just almost arming brothers at each, you know, uh, particular chapter to, uh, to be able to kind of keep that up and, uh, you know, moving forward is, is great too. But now always good to see that the, that the fraternity is uh, reacting in, in a good way. Yes. In terms of in terms of your your ambitions and really looking far out uh, into the future, some of the what are some of the things you would hope to be involved in or to uh, accomplish? Uh, yeah, what are, what are some of your your interests uh, longer term, uh, because you seem like someone who has a capacity to have impact in a lot of areas and most any to have an impact on most anything you put your mind to, quite honestly. So what are what are some things you, you think you might put your hands and mind to in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I do like to be in areas of growth. And when I think about that broadly, especially for today, and looking at someone in my generation where the world is going, I think of just generally having an interest in wanting to be involved in AI, as I'm doing, of course, you know, with Eversort now, um, space and space technology. One thing I didn't really even mention is that I was part of a, you know, an early group of the of Harvard Space Exploration and Admiralty Law Society, and you know, also uh, lobbied hard for us to, you know, actually have a space law journal, as I think that more and more in the future issues around, you know, uh, kind of power and dynamics of and ownership of things outside of Earth are going to be more important, and we yes. should be thinking about it now. Um, 
And then Africa, I mean, I think that, uh, and, and I've already begun investing in things there, and of course have lots of family there and visit often, but it's the, you know, very young continent. It's kind of where mm -hmm. the bulge of the world is today. It's where future markets are going to be and are growing. And of course, I think we all know China is doing a bit better than America from that perspective, but just more broadly, I think those are three areas where I definitely want to remain, uh, you know, connected to as things continue. So a AI, uh, space, law, and, uh, and the continent of Africa and, the, and uh, developing the potential there. Yeah, 100%. Like, yes. Uh, so you've accomplished a good bit in your, in your young life. How old are you? Uh, 27, but my birthday is next week. Okay, soon to be 28. So you've accomplished a lot. So you could, uh, we've got undergraduate brothers and, and brothers about to graduate or new graduates today. What are, what are, what's some advice that you would give to, uh, to those brothers who are uh, looking soon to, uh, to embark on, on uh, careers? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I'd say I'd say it's twofold. One, I would definitely suggest, and I always call it kind of leading with yes. Um, leading with it, yes. Leading with yes. But it's to say that as opportunities arise over time, a lot of times your initial reaction to those will directly affect whether or not you can pursue them moving forward. And so if your initial reaction is to kind of recoil and step back and maybe take a little bit of time to think, et cetera, you might be missing out in what are you know, uniquely once in a lifetime opportunities. And so when I say lead with yes, it's that when you see an opportunity that you're unsure about, I think you should lead with you know, at least accepting it, thinking about it from that perspective. You know, it's easier to step back than to step back in from that perspective. And I think that you should be looking at those and, and really not self-selecting yourself out of opportunities, right? It's, uh, I think it's also an idea of you know, people are like, oh, should I apply for this job? I don't think I'm qualified. And, you know, my response is always, why are you applying to a job that you're qualified for? You know, you should be, you know, you should, should be something that you're growing and learning every day as you're in it. And if it's something that you're just perfectly qualified for, then don't even apply. They should just give it to you, you know? You're so. going to be bored very quickly, right? Is that, the, is that your thought? Exactly. You're already qualified, yeah. Yeah, and so I think that, I do think that folks should, uh, especially I know in an era where, you know, right now, especially as things go more virtual, people might be more static thinking, hey, maybe I should hold, I should wait. But I think it's actually a more unique opportunity to be out there networking and, and building relationships because now people are not going to be, they're going to be at least less put off by someone who they might only know virtually, right? And so yes. to create those kinds of relationships with folks, this could actually be a perfect time to be getting yourselves out there, you know, building up that network and, and get, getting to know folks as opposed to a time to be in stasis. Right, right. Yes, very good. Well, May May, we, uh, we appreciate your time uh, today and uh, look forward to hearing more uh, about your career. I, I know there'll be, you'll have more interesting stories to tell uh, as time goes by. Anything more? Anything more you wanted to offer before we before we close? Um, one thing I did want to note too, though, is actually that um, you know, I talked a lot about um, Andrew Paik and his uh, his mentorship as me as I went to Harvard Law, and I feel like I'd be remiss not to talk about another great Fiji who took a similar path, and that's you know um, uh, that's one of uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch, you know, who's a FIGAM himself, yes. and also went to Harvard Law, and I think the first time that he ever clerked was under uh, Justice Byron Wright, White, who was another Phi Gamma Delta. And so yes. this, yes. you know, kind of Fiji's helping each other up into That's these right. broader uh, places, I think is something that runs in our history. And uh, Justice Gorsuch, if you're listening, you know, I'm happy to kind of be the next <laughs> Ready, Ready for another mentor at some point, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. You think big, I like that. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I appreciate you think, it. You think big. Thanks, May May, for being with us. Again, we look we look forward to following following your career, and and uh, you've got a great story, and and I've enjoyed uh, being a part of the exposing some other brothers to it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, to our viewers and listeners, we we thank you for joining us for this edition of On the Banks. There are many many interesting stories uh, out there in Fiji land. We, uh, we look forward to continuing to, uh, to tell them uh, and helping you to meet new brothers and hear those stories. And until next time, I'm mighty proud to be a Fiji. Thank you.